Madam Chair, your life. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our quarterly board meeting. Let me begin by asking Toya to, to please take roll. Yes. Oh, if the uh, members who are on Zoom could go ahead and come off of mute so you can prepare for roll call. Thank you. Yes, Madam Chair. Senator David Argyle or designee Cindy Urban. I'm here. Governor Robert Bogle. Representative Tim Briggs. Governor William Gindelsberger. Governor Abigail Hancocks. Here. Secretary Akbar Hussein or his designee Katie Merritt. Governor Daniel Klingerman. Vice Chair David Mazur. Governor Marion Moskowitz. Secretary Mumin or his designee, Kate Shaw. Representative Brad Roy. Here. Senator Judith Schwank. Present. Cynthia Shapira, our chair. Here. Governor Larry Skinner. Vice Chair Here. Samuel. Got it. Vice Chair Samuel Smith. Here. Governor Skylar Walder. Here. Secretary Neil Weaver. Here. Governor Janet Yeomans. Dr. Tina Torelli Helminiak. Present. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you very much. Uh, let me invite everybody to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, which I believe will be on the, our screens. There we go. I pledge Let me first offer a word of uh, uh, great appreciation to everyone here at the Alexander Grass campus uh, for hosting us. Um, you, you are so wonderful and we so appreciate it. Um, and we love what feels like coming home uh, for these, these couple of days. Um, since we sold the campus two years ago, which is hard for me to believe that it's been two years already, um, uh, the Alexander Grass campus has uh, been hosting us for our meetings, and again, we really thank them for their hospitality. Let me also welcome Katie Merritt from the Governor's Policy Office, who is here on behalf of Governor Shapiro today. And also, uh, I would like to recognize um, former Secretary John Wetzel, who is chair of the Commonwealth University Council of Trustees, and he is with us here today as well. So welcome. Well, okay, this is our first meeting of 2024. And while our universities have been buzzing back to life over the last few weeks, um, it's kind of been a busy time here in Harrisburg as well. Uh, we all know that earlier this week, Governor Shapiro announced his vision for enhancing the broader education, higher education landscape here in Pennsylvania. And while we know that this is only the start of a long conversation regarding the budget and the broader proposal. We also know that the governor's proposal calls for a new governance model that could create uh, so much more collaboration and coordination uh, in our sector. The governor recognizes the important work that PASHI has done with our own system redesign uh, over uh, recent years, and he seeks to infuse that same spirit of transformation across the rest of Pennsylvania higher education. Among other things, his proposal, of course, would create a new public system consisting of our 10 PASHI universities and the 15 community colleges as equal partners. This new comprehensive system could open so many more opportunities for students through greater collaboration and coordination uh, and ease of entry and continuance in their educational journey and I will uh, reiterate, as I always do, and as this board always does, that our students are 
our number one priority. Um, and everything we do should be to the benefit of our students. <clears throat> Here at PASHI, we know firsthand how system thinking, thinking as a system, acting as a system, can mobilize people to achieve good outcomes. And again, just consider what has been accomplished in the past six or seven years. Not that it isn't all perfect and not that we don't continue to have challenges, but today we do see stronger financial sustainability, we see increased enrollment of new students, and we see uh, much greater teamwork and coordination and sharing across our own system. Most importantly, our students are the beneficiary of these efforts, and this all has allowed us to hold tuition flat for six straight years, which is a pretty great accomplishment in public higher education. So together, we not only share a common mission and common ideas, but our universities quite literally share talent, services, resources, programs, each other, and so much more. The sharing has led to a new level of systemness, uh, as we are seeing it, that has never before existed in PASHI. And, uh, you know, from my perspective, in my eighth year serving on this board, it's a sea change, a complete, utter sea change. Understanding how to act as a system in the best sense of it will be critical in the creation of a new public higher education system in Pennsylvania. And again, we acknowledge that we're not perfect, but what we have learned in recent years is that we definitely are stronger together. We can achieve so much more when we work together. So I just want us to imagine that level and even higher of student-centeredness, connection, collaboration, and sharing that level of true systemness across all 25 community colleges and PASHA University campuses that is now a real possibility before us. And if we do this right, the new system represents an opportunity to be transformational in the truest sense of the word and in the best sense of the word. And we so look forward to continuing these conversations in the coming months. Uh, so having said that, and I truly believe these words with all of my heart uh, when I say them, um, I'm going to now focus us uh, on the work that is in front of us right here at PASHI in the here and now. We remain focused on our mission to ensure that we help every student get the, a great education, obtain a valuable credential that will help that person uh, in the workplace, um, and to enhance his or her own life. So in today's meeting, we're going to focus on moving PASHI forward and ensuring that we do continue to support our students in every way possible. So I thank you all so much for being here on this journey with me, with all of us together. And with that, why don't we get started? All right, our first order of business um, is to hear remarks from our union leaders, and let me call on Dr. Ken Mash to speak on behalf of APSCA. I'll start over again. <laughs> and we missed the best part. <laughs> yeah. You missed all the thank yous. Now, I thought rest. Dan was going to sit there and be thinking, did he really say that? I can't, I'm not sure I can hear it. But I, I do want to, I just want to brass our thanks to the administrators who worked on uh, the negotiation uh, for faculty agreement in principle. Uh, while we disagree considerably and uh, we still do disagree about some things. I think that there are some really very important things that occurred in this agreement in principle that are going to come back and reflect well on us as a system. 
Um, it was the product of months and months of hard work by a lot of people. And I know that my faculty colleagues appreciate the commitment of those at the table to do what is in the best interest of all, uh, especially for our students. And I can say similar things about the negotiation of the contract for the coaches, which is not yet complete. Uh, there's been a lot of progress made on some very important issues. There are only a few issues remaining, but one of those, an important one, job security, remains uh, a serious problem. Chairwoman, Chancellor, Governors, your negotiators have made it clear that they will not budge on the issue of fundamental fairness. Now, I haven't made it a habit of speaking about specific contract issues at board meetings, but this issue is one that seems to defy all logic, runs counter to basic issues of public employment, and is truly not about money. In fact, I'm not even quite sure what the issue is or what the holdup is or what the reason is for the in insistence on the part of the system that nothing be changed. Now we're told that our coaches are protected better than any unionized or non-unionized co uh, coaches in the country. That simply isn't true. Um, at least one faculty contract in the country still covers coaches, but even so, Bear in mind that the bar is ridiculously low, and it's not a righteous position to compare yourself to the bottom. Our coaches are not looking for tenure. They don't think they're faculty. And right now in our current CBA, they can be eligible for a two or three year rollover contract. But to get those contracts, and remember that no system coach, if they're going to be non-renewed is gonna to have to be paid out millions and millions of dollars like we read in the newspapers for some university. But they have to, in order to be eligible for those rollover contracts, to be on probation for five years. Five years. Other than faculty, what other unionized worker has to wait five years? But coaches aren't faculty. And the commitment made to them does not come close to the commitment made to faculty. And the coaches are not asking for what the faculty have. What do they want? They want the five years to be a more reasonable three years. What do they want? They want their renewal decisions based on the evaluations that they are required to uh, complete every single year. Right now, they could be non-renewed for such reasons as we want to go in a different direction. Or we want to get someone who better fits the culture here. And they could do that even if they have had positive uh, valuations year after year. And in fact, we had a coach, at least one, um, who worked and was very close to retirement and had, had positive valuations and would have had the protections you know, and the rights that were given to retirees, but they were non-renewed just months before they were set to retire. What do the coaches want? They want the ability to grieve non-renewal decisions should they be problematic. What do they want? They want contract language that says that a non-renewal decision cannot be arbitrary or capricious. That's really asking a lot. They want language that says, for goodness sake, that the decision cannot be discriminatory. That's right. The system, your negotiators, want to maintain their right to be discriminatory in non-renewal decisions. How, just how, is that a defensible position? That's what they want. Those are the things that they want. Well, not actually, because our coaches are not asking for all of that. In the latest round of negotiations, they said, just give us something here after you know, decades of trying to get some greater job protection. They wanna see some progress. It just should not be okay to have your representatives bang on the table and announce things here will not change. 
under no circumstances will they change. It just isn't right. It is just not a good way to treat people. I sincerely hope that there is some reconsideration of this position. Now I have to say, who knows? Maybe the coaches will settle as they have before without including any job security. After all, when their minimum salaries are below the poverty line for a household of two, right? They can be forgiven if they'll sign on the dotted line to get some additional money to put the food on the table. But is that really the position that you want to take? That you want to allow your negotiation negotiators to put the coaches in the position of? And it certainly leaves a bad taste in the mouths of my faculty and coach colleagues, just as I hope it would leave a bad taste in each one of your mouths. Governors, I certainly hope you could put the word in for how you believe that those who are primarily responsible for the well-being of our wonderful student athletes be treated with just a little bit more respect. If it's all, truly all about the students, let's think about those people who have to guide them, who stand by them, who devote hours after hour and hour and hour and hour to make sure that they're good. Remember, your, this negotiations team, the systems negotiations team represents each one of you. And let's really remember that it is about the students. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Mash. Let me ask, uh... Dr. Todd Spaulding uh, to come to the podium to speak on behalf of SCUPA. He's going to speak over here. Oh, okay. That's fine. All right. Thank you. Um, good morning, Chancellor, Chairwoman Shapiro, Board of Governors, Presidents, and Community Members. Um, as you know, my name is Todd Spaulding. I am the Vice President and Chief Negotiator for the State College and Universities Professional Association. SCUPA represents over 700 professionals who are dedicated to our students and our campuses. Today, my brief remarks are about the SCUPA tentative agreement, and today is a good day for students, for SCUPA, and for the PASHI system. I would like to take this time to acknowledge the SCUPA bargaining unit members for whom this tentative agreement would not be possible, I'd also like to take this time to acknowledge SCUPA's bargaining team consisting of our campus or our statewide president, Francis Cortez Funk, John Gradle, Joe Miller, William Zimmerman, Rita Miller, Gretchen Osterman, Aaron Fritz, and our Uniserve rep, Adam Weber. Many are here, some of them are here today. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge Poshi's bargaining team for their professionalism and commitment to working with SCUPA to reach a tentative agreement. Their team consisted of Melissa Mullen, Brittany Lentz, Mike Ferguson, David Wilms, Eric Geiser, and John Grunewald. <clears throat> We're, we are current, we are actively working with and influencing every aspect of our campuses on a daily basis. Um, we are a small but mighty group, and we get the job done. Um, today, we look forward to the Board of Governors voting to approve our contract. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Spaulding. Uh, let me call on PACT President uh, Rich Ferrix for remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to address the board. And as we begin the spring semester, I thought it would be appropriate to inform you about the activities of PACT as we support the role of our university trustees, not only in their roles on the individual campuses, but also in understanding their role in the system. I believe it is important for the Board of Governors to understand the role and activities of PACT as it supports the system. The role of trustee is a volunteer position that is often merged with an already busy work and life schedule. Added to this schedule is the task of staying abreast of what is happening on their individual campuses, 
making it difficult at times to keep up with what is happening in the system as a whole and how it impacts their specific universities. Trustees are asked to react to a myriad of items that affect their university. As they react, it is important that they understand how their university fits into the system. Our chancellor just, excuse me, our chair just spoke about systemness. And we cannot truly be a system if we as trustees are not kept abreast of what is happening in the system and asked to be participants in that discussion and then discuss it on our individual campuses. How do we as PAC engage our trustees? With the assistance of system staff, specifically Randy Gowen and Toya Hayward, we begin our support by providing periodic email updates on the system. As you can imagine, the trustees are interested in many of the items that are presented in the governor's budget address, specifically a blueprint for higher education, a new system of state universities and community colleges, and a cost of education proposal are at the top of the list of waiting for more information. Changes to the FAFSA and an update of the system financial risk as discussed at yesterday's workshop are additional items of interest as trustees negotiate the impact on their individual institutions. Periodic emails provided by PAC help with these updates. In addition, trustees are invited to the quarterly Board of Governors meetings with the chancellor and his staff. And during these meetings, the trustees are updated on Board of Governors agenda and offered an opportunity to ask relevant questions about the workings of the system. The role of a trustee in the state system is quite different from the role of a trustee at a private or state-related institution. We have different responsibilities and authorities. To better understand the roles, PACT has invited representatives from the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, ACTA, to help us explore these differences and how we can respond. Our annual conference is scheduled this year on April the 3rd. I believe the heart of our councils is our student trustees. These are members of the council that live with the decision of the council on a daily basis. So it's important to provide professional development to these trustees. Twice a semester, we offer opportunities to get involved. In a few weeks, the student trustees will meet Ruby Mundock, a Millersville University graduate and executive director of Governor Shapiro's Advisory C Commission for Next Generation Engagement to discuss how they can be involved in these engagement opportunities. Many of our universities have experienced a turnover in trustees, and many of these trustees are receiving their campus orientations as we speak. To build on these orientations, next month, with the assistance of system staff, we will invite them to a system orientation, focusing on new trustees, but open to all trustees. This orientation will reinforce their roles as trustees. These are just a few of the activities that PAC offers to keep our trustees informed and engaged and to promote systemness. Our appointment as a state system trustee automatically makes us members of the state system, and it is imperative that we keep abreast of what is happening in and to the system. The information provided by PAC enable trustees to be influential members of our campus and the system. Thank you for the opportunity to share this information with you. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Okay, uh, we are now going to provide an opportunity for public comment and Randy, let me ask you to facilitate that. Sure, for public comment, we routinely post on our website an opportunity for folks who cannot come in person to request an opportunity to speak via phone. <clears throat> we receive no request in that regard, but we also have the opportunity for anyone here in the public who wishes to speak to do so in person. I know we have a couple of guests to join us, so we'll ask our first to come to the podium. State your name, and you have uh, three minutes. Hi, my name's Kelly Schrout. I am a lead baker at Penn West University, Edinburgh, where I have been serving students for more than 42 years. 
I work hard to prepare and serve nutrition meals to our students because I know how important proper nutrition is to a good education. I take my job seriously because I love the students and want to do my part to help them succeed. Through our years of service, my coworkers and I have earned the fair pay, affordable health insurance, retirement benefits, and voice on the job outlined in our collective bargaining agreement. Working with our union, the Pennsylvania Joint Board Workers Unite, and negotiating with our employers, we have made our jobs the kind of jo good jobs that taxpayers' dollars in Pennsylvania should create. We, we certainly are not making a killing, but the wages and benefits we have negotiate allow us to take care of ourselves and our families and our voice on the job helps us keep it that way. We ask PASHI to have the contractors keep our contract that we have right now the contract for food service vendors at Penn West Edinburgh and Penn West Clarion are out to bid. We understand that the winning bidder may be selected sometime this month. If our current employer, Aramark, is not selected as the winning bidder, then the new food service vendor should honor our con collective bargaining agreements. We are here today to call on PASHI to take all responsible measures to ensure that the winning bidder agrees to honor the CBA that we and our union siblings at Clarion have negotiated. This includes taking all responsibility measures to ensure that the winning bidder agrees to participate in the union sponsored pension and health insurance fund that allows us to take care of ourselves and our family and look forward to a successful retirement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your remarks. Appreciate it. One more. Hello, my name is Patty Herta. I've been with Edinburgh for 34 years um, as a food service worker. Uh, food service workers across the state system work hard to serve the PASHI students. Not only are we there you know, to make them breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But some of these kids have never been away from their parents. So we're also there to like lend an ear to talk to them and stuff like that. Uh, PASHI made a decision many years ago to shift the responsibility for feeding students to third party contractors. But the state system will have a moral responsibility to ensure that all jobs on campuses are good jobs. Through our years of service, Workers United members have made our jobs good jobs. We have earned the fair pay, affordable health insurance, retirement benefits, and voice on the job outlined in our collective bargaining agreement. Our jobs are the kind of good jobs that taxpayer dollars in Pennsylvania should create. We understand that PASHI will soon choose the vendor or vendors who will be awarded the food service contracts at Penn West Edinburgh and Penn West Clarion. We are here to call on PASHI to ensure that any change in contractors does not mean a change in our pay, benefits, or seniority for food service workers at either campus. Um, workers United represents food service workers at eight PASHI campuses. Workers United members maintain good relationships with students, faculty, and surrounding communities at each of these campuses. We look forward to continue working with the state system and with whatever food service vendor is retained at Edinburgh and Clarion. Uh, we are prepared to mobilize on campus and in our communities to take action if our hard earned wage and working conditions are undermined. Basically, we've worked hard for what we have in our contract and we like to keep our wages, pension, health insurance with a new upcoming vendor. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your comments. Appreciate it. Randy, is that... Are there any other members of the public who wish to address the board? All right, Madam Chair, we have no others. Okay, we're going to now move on to our consent agenda, and these are the items listed in the consent agenda. The meeting minutes, uh, the meeting calendar, 
um, and a student member appointment extension. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as listed? So moved. Thank Second. you. Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. The motion carries. Let me now turn to uh, Dan, uh, our chancellor, for his remarks. Under our, under our remarks, the new filings have been created. Thank you. Um, whoa. It, 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 it is uh, somehow not lost on me that um, five years ago around this time, it was the January board meeting, we moved them to February, uh, I gave my inaugural remarks as chancellor. Um, and uh, it, so, you know, I looked at them again last night because I figured maybe if I could crib some stuff out of the inaugural remarks, I wouldn't have to make as so much up. Maybe it was a, uh, an efficiency measure. Um, and, and and so I want to just crib a little bit uh, from from them. And I had just completed my, I guess, first tour, first of something like 10 tours of all of our universities and, you know, spoke, I had a lot more energy than, than I do now. And I spoke, spoken to literally hundreds, if not thousands of people about, about, you know, who we are and what we should, what we could or should become. And I reflected in those remarks about, about what I had discovered on my, on that journey. Um, and so, uh, quoting largely, uh, noticing that our 14 universities have been around a long time. I think the oldest was then 181 and the youngest 125 years of age. Um, and reflecting on, you know, the time during that time, you know, those universities have provided life-changing opportunities to millions of students, helping them to improve their lives and lives of their families. I think since then I say, you know, we change lives. I think we save a few. Um, and during that entire duration, our universities have consistently and purposefully and effectively pursued a kind of a singular mission, which is high quality workforce aligned education for the people of this Commonwealth. And that history is something that everybody in this room can and should be proud of. And I also reported on the, what I found at, at the universities themselves through those visits. And, and again, I'll quote, an amazing collection of institutions, I said, populated by incredible people, students, faculty, staff, who take quite seriously why they are there and have immense pride in our mission. I found universities that provide the kind of engaging experiences you see at the best liberal arts colleges only at a public university price. I found universities that are unique in the educational programs that they offer. Their distinctiveness stands out in quiet, confident, defiant of a misguided or what was then a misguided and inaccurate public narrative that somehow they are all the same. I found universities that are responsive to changing societal needs, again, defying a different public narrative that they offer a broad array of educational opportunities focused increasingly on those aligned with employer needs in healthcare, business, STEM, and other areas. And I found universities that house some of the most innovative practices that I've seen in higher education, and I've seen a lot uh, in, in, in my career. But above all, I found a profound sense of optimism amongst people, our faculty and our staff, who at that stage had experienced deep cumulative budget cuts for well over a decade, but who nonetheless held the desire to hope and to create our future, to not only survive, but to thrive. So that's the end of the quote. So the rest of the stuff I actually had to do this morning. <laughs> so if you flash forward five years, it's really to our people, our faculty and staff that I want to address the rest of my remarks as your chancellor. There has been a lot of conversation about broken systems. Maybe, maybe systems are broken. I don't need to have a point of view. But I know for a fact that the people who have built our universities and who run them and who work in them every day, you aren't broken. You may be underserved with regard to public investment, but you're not broken, not by a long shot. Five years ago, you were delivering student outcomes, graduation and persistent rates that were better than the average nationally in our sector. Today, those graduation and persistent rates have only improved, and that's despite a global pandemic. 
And that improvement is evident in enrollments, which are beginning to grow after a dozen years of decline, and student retention rates, which are ticking up, and attainment gaps, which are being meaningfully addressed. And none of that just simply happened. It resulted from your hard and purposeful and mission-driven work. Last point, I guess. During university visits last term, I saw you putting to work some of the significant additional public investment that we have enjoyed from the Commonwealth uh, and for which we are grateful. It totals something like 600 and some odd million dollars uh, over the last uh, few years. Um, so just reflecting on some of that, how that money is being put to work, investment in, investment in, in, in us. Uh, I saw you utilizing the technology infrastructure that we're building in support of a vision that every student anywhere at any campus should have access to courses and programs anywhere across the system. That infrastructure is being used today at our integrated universities. It ensures that students at universities that are too small to sustain more than a couple of dozen programs, majors, minors, et cetera, have access to 80, 100, and more because they deserve to. And I know that in the coming months, we're working with our, our, our chief academic officers and our faculty council. Thank you, Tina. We'll be learning how to use that infrastructure because it's rolling out across the system so that students beyond those at the integrated universities can also benefit. I saw faculty developing courses so that students who complete them don't just get credit towards their degree, they earn a credential that has immediate value in the market. And we've heard from uh, uh, Dean Williams at East Stroudsburg University, and there are others uh, who are engaged actively in this kind of work, the Grow with Google uh, uh, partnership that we, uh, that we struck a few months ago. Um, the work that's happening at Kutztown uh, using platforms that enable uh, students to engage directly in credentialing activities, ensure that our students, no matter, you know, those who have to take a somewhat deviate on their journey to getting a degree and take longer than four years and life uh, gets in the way, can accumulate credentials that work for them as they go. I saw staff working in wholly new ways to ensure that our students succeed to ensure that those who enroll in our universities cross the finish line and graduate. I saw student success centers that are up and running. The Commonwealth, they're one-stop shops where a student can go to find the professional staff that they need to help them with a whole range of issues from mental health and wellness counseling to career services and financial aid advising instead of having to figure out where everybody is. I saw multicultural centers which strive to ensure that all students at our who enroll feel welcomed in our university communities and have every chance to succeed in crossing the finish line. I saw folks at universities thinking and working in wholly new ways so that more students have an opportunity to engage in, all right, an alert. This is a term of art alert. So that more students have an opportunity to engage in a work-based learning experience. Mm -hmm. Did I get that right, shall I? Which might be called an internship. <laughs> but it also includes things like, you know, capstone and research projects that are engaged by students who are working directly with an employer and prepare them for the world of work. Uh, and, and, and this is happening at universities who are working to ensure that up to 50% more of their students have an opportunity to have a work-based learning, uh, uh, work learning experience. Um, and I met with faculty who are engaging with a new partner, one that you heard from, uh, I think Kevin Rumpelen, several months ago, AQ. Uh, which works with our faculty to help engage even more effectively with our students, whether in face-to-face, -face, hybrid, or fully online environments. So a long while back, we talked about system redesigns two goals. So one of them, obviously, was a short-term goal, financial stabilization. And, and while there's more to do, we've done a lot and made a lot of progress. The second-term goal is really the harder, the longer, and the more challenging one. And this gets to something that we talk about a lot that we already know. In order to continue to be of service to the state, we need to ensure that more people get into and through some form of post-secondary education. I won't bore you again with the numbers, but I'll just say them in case you've forgotten. 60% of our jobs today in Pennsylvania require somebody in them with a post-secondary education, which only 51% of our adults have. That means that more people need to get into and get through some form of post-secondary education if we are to keep the lights on in the economy of Pennsylvania. 
This is not about taking students who would otherwise go to another college or university, whether in this state or another one, and putting them in one of ours. That doesn't solve the problem. The only way to solve the problem is to get students who would not otherwise attend a post-secondary education and get them into and through some form of higher education, which means we have to open the aperture and engage with people who are not always coming directly out of high school, which is our traditional market who we are really good at serving. And this is complicated because it means that we have to learn to work in new ways. Because as I love to say, education, Randy doesn't let me say fire hose, but I, education is not a fire hose. You don't just turn it to the next person and they get as wet as the last. It's a highly personalized activity. The engaging with someone who's just lost their job and is in their 50s and wants to upskill so they can remain relevant in the job market is completely different than dealing with my kid, which is completely different than engaging effectively with a student from rural Pennsylvania who's the first in her family to go to college. These are all different activities. And they're not just different for faculty, they're different for financial aid advisors, for student success coaches, and for people who do health and wellness counseling. People are different, which means we have to invest in our folks and upskill and reskill. We hear a lot about investment in public higher education, a lot about student affordability. I think one of the unrecognized issues and secrets in a way is that it also requires investment in our people so that they can be as good as they can be and they can evolve as they must in order to serve the state. Um, in my remarks, I said something about being tremendously proud uh, to work with uh, our universities and the faculty and staff who make them such wonderfully, wonderful places five years on. I still have that deep pride uh, and that sense of tremendous optimism. So uh, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Chancellor. All right, we are now going to move into our committee sessions. Uh, so again, just as a reminder, while only committee members are permitted to actually vote, all board members are encouraged to ask questions uh, if there are any during the committee sessions. Um, and uh, what we'll do is uh, have these questions uh, and answers, discussions, take place during committee, and then when we move to full board for ratification, that'll make that process uh, more efficient. So let me now call on uh, Governor Larry Skinner to moderate the University Success Committee. Oh, thank you, Madam. There you are, okay. I'm here. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning and welcome. I will ask Toya to do a roll call of the University Success Committee. I will. Chair, Governor Larry Skinner. Here. Vice Chair, Governor Neil Weaver. Here. Governor William Gindelsberger. Governor Shapiro's designee, Katie Merritt. Representative Brad Roy. Here. Governor Daniel Klingerman. Governor Skylar Walder. Here. Governor Janet Yeomans. Here. Cynthia Shapiro. Here and President Charles Patterson. Thank you. Thank you, Toya. Today we have three action items all pertaining to property and capital related activities. These include the annual approval of system's current year capital budget and two property dispositions for Penn West University. The first item on our committee agenda is the approval of the capital spending plan as presented in the board materials. Annually, the board approves the capital spending plan outlining the projects for the current year funding. The 2023-2024 state system capital budget allocation is $70 million. The attached plan is responsive to emerging needs of universities who are continually addressing considerations around enrollment, space utilization, and academic programs. I would like to turn it over to Molly to review these items. Molly? Good morning. Good morning. The proposed 2324 capital plan reflects the allocation of 70 million towards addressing university needs. 
The plan includes critical renovations at Commonwealth's library at Lock Haven to address extensive building maintenance and infrastructure requirements. Additionally, the plan includes Cheney University's comprehensive renovation of their dining hall, which includes roof replacement, mechanical, comprehensive electrical and plumbing upgrades, as well as programmatic improvements. Cheney University is also redirecting a portion of their allocated funds from the dining hall renovation to meet escalating costs associated with replacing the COPE athletic complex. This year's plan also includes funding for Indiana University's culinary building construction. Additionally, IUP also has a small allocation for a facility-oriented feasibility study to assess and outline details of renovation requirements for the proposed College of Osteopathic Medicine. Completing the plan are Millersville University design funds for renovation of their science center, as well as funds allocated for furniture and fixtures for two previously approved projects. Collectively, these projects are positioned to address immediate and significant needs and were evaluated in the context of university integrations. Regarding the capital process overall, the system is engaged in a collaborative effort with the Department of General Services to evaluate opportunities for potential redesign of the capital requests and associated processes. Any changes resulting from this collaboration will be incorporated into subsequent year's processes. While a draft five-year rolling plan is provided for informational purposes, the board approves the 23-24 spending plan. That concludes my report. Thank you, Molly. Based on the information that was just shared with us as outlined in the board materials, I move that the committee recommends the Board of Governors approve the fiscal year 2023-2024 capital spending plan as reflected in attachment one. Is there a second? There was a second. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. That's okay. Any discussion? Committee members, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. The next two items are property actions for Penn West University. As part of their sust sustainability work, Penn West has been examining their physical space footprint and has finalized two opportunities to eliminate underutilized space. By accomplishing these two property actions, Penn West will be realizing savings, ensuring ongoing support for any impacted students, and generating positive community outcomes through repurposing the facilities. I would like to turn it over to Molly to walk us through the two property disposal motions. Thank you. I'll step through each of these first um, on Venango. So Penn West seeks approval to transfer its Clarion Venango property as an important step in their continued financial sustainability work. This property disposition is due to declining enrollment at this location, the opportunity to eliminate certain expense obligations, and to provide a stronger set of academic and support students for stu support for students currently at this location. Enrollment at the Venango location has declined in recent years from 450 students in 2001 to now only 95 in fall of 2023. Most students are in the Associate Degree in Nursing or ASN program, which is the only offering there. The ASN program will be transferred to the Clarion location, effective fall 2024. The transfer of this program to the Clarion location will provide students with access to a full breadth of academic and student support services. Clarion has state-of-the-art simulation labs, and students will have access to a greater number of elective courses and extracurricular opportunities. The faculty previously based at Venango will continue to teach the ASN program courses and clinical experiences, and staff at Venango will be offered positions in connection with existing needs at other Penn West locations. The transfer of this property will eliminate losses from underutilization of the space and deferred maintenance, saving approximately 1.3 million annually and avoiding 6 million in necessary maintenance. The property spans approximately 62 acres across five buildings, totaling approximately 85,000 square feet. The Oil Region Alliance contacted Penn West leadership for their interest in repurposing the space for regional development. 
Accordingly, the university is exploring options to dispose of the property and approval from the General Assembly is required for the transfer. Our next update on the second motion, that is the Phillipsburg building. Also, as Penn West assesses that space footprint as part of their overall financial sustainability work, the university seeks approval to transfer or sell the property known as the Phillipsburg building located in a neighboring area to the California campus location. The property is not currently in use. It's neither contiguous to the university nor considered to have a strategic purpose at this time. Penn West has developed a plan to sell the property to an entity with potential opportunities for alignment to the mission of the university and its students. California University purchased the facility in 2009. The property is on less than an acre with an approximately 18,000 square foot building containing office and classroom spaces. The sale or transfer of this property will require notification to and favorable resolution from the General Assembly. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Based on the information that was just shared with us as outlined in the board materials, I will present each motion for approval. Based on the information that was just shared with us as outlined in the board materials, I move that the committee recommends the Board of Governors approves Penn West's request to proceed with disposition of property at the Venango location. Is there a second? There's a second in the room. Thank you. Any discussion? Committee members, all in favor say aye. 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 Regarding the second property motion presented, I move that the committee recommends the Board of Governors approves the Penn West request to proceed with disposition of the property known as Phillipsburg Building. Is there a second? Any discussion? Committee members, all in favor say aye. 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 Madam Chair, that concludes the work of the University Success Committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Skinner. Appreciate it. Now let me call on the Honorable Sam Smith to moderate the Governance and Leadership Committee meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Toya, will you please take the role of the Governance and Leadership Committee? Committee Chair. Here. Governor David Mazur. Present. Governor Present. Abigail Hancox. Here. Senator Judith Swank. Here. Chair Cynthia Shapira. Here. And President Kenneth Long. This completes the roll. Thank you, Toya. We'll start. We have two two uh, actions. One is a appointment of a student trustee for Commonwealth. And then we have a consideration of a policy update. So we're going to start with the uh, student trustee appointment. Um, is I think most of us can recognize on the Board of Governors, we know what the student Board of Governors mean to us. Uh, in terms of bringing that perspective and just kind of the you know the kind of the, the different interaction we have with the students than we might have with each other as board members um, that aren't students and it, and we know how important that is well the same thing obviously applies to the uh, student trustees uh, at, at each of our uh, universities I am very comfortable that the the process that's still relatively new I, I think our presidents are committed to helping find you know, the, the best students uh, from within their respective schools uh, to, to, to serve in this capacity. And I, I think it really has worked very well, quite, quite honestly. Um, but I think that the, uh, the, the process to identify and vet the candidates is, is, is working well mm -hmm. and um, allows us to move through this process much more expeditiously. Um, um, the agenda packet, packet uh, has additional information about uh, the uh, student trustee we're going to consider today if you want to get some additional background. However, we are going to uh, bring forward, and we're pleased to bring forward, Mavens, Marvin's Ravix from Commonwealth University, Mansfield. And I will ask President Hanna to uh, provide us a little uh, introduction to Marvin's. Thank you, Governor Smith. Um, good morning, all. I'm delighted to bring forward uh, Marvin Zrefkis as a candidate for the student trustee representing our uh, Commonwealth University Mansfield campus. Uh, Marvin is a junior uh, pursuing a bachelor's degree in biology with a goal of becoming a physician's assistant one day. He's a graduate of Norristown Area High School. Uh, he is a first generation college student and an immigrant. Marvin grew up in Haiti. Uh, he is also serving our country as a specialist in the Army National Guards. 
Marvin speaks three languages. I'm jealous because <laughs> I only speak two. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Humble brag. <laughs> sorry. Shameless. Uh, <laughs> uh, the clubs and organizations he participates in are numerous. Um, he represents the best of what our universities offer. So I bring him forward for your consideration without a single doubt. Thank you, sir. Thank you, President Hanna. May I have a motion from the com a committee member that recommends the Board of Governors appoint Marvin Zravix to the Commonwealth University Council of Trustees? So moved. And seconded? Second. Thank you. Is there any other discussion from any committee members or the board? Hearing none, those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay. aye. aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, uh, we are glad to welcome Marvin's Randy. Yes, Marvin is joining us on Zoom, so he will Great. be able to offer some comments. Oh, I would like to say thank you, everyone. And is it with humility and gratitude to ask them before you today to be considered for this role or to be a student trustee at Commonwealth University of Mansfield? I'm committed to be a voice for my peers to listen with an open heart and to contribute constructively to our university's legacy and to make a, an environment where everyone feels included. Thank you. All right, thank you, Marvin. In spite of President Hans duplicitous <laughs> injection on that i would I'd say that it sounds from from the information you provide us you guys are really lucky uh, i'm sometimes intimidated by these students uh, <laughs> both our our student uh, board of governors members and our student trustees when i look at them and 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 think of like well i've been able to do that when i was you know at that point in my life and i the answer has always been no i couldn't have done yeah. that and so i'm always somewhat uh, intimidated along with being impressed with with these uh, people that uh, we bring in to help us govern. So uh, our next uh, order of action is a policy change um, and it will be an update to an existing board policy. Uh, basically, Randy is gonna give us a little more detail of it, but it really has to do with trying to uh, allow our students to take jobs within the university uh, in a timely fashion. So uh, it, I, I think it's a, simple change in many respects. So Randy, you want to yeah, give us a little you. more detail? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And it, it, on the heels of hearing from a great student, this um, this policy change is actually driven by uh, students and uh, driven by uh, the staff at the universities who are working with those students. And the, the challenge we face is this. We have a lot of work, uh, a lot of student employees, a number of them who are uh, securing their roles through work study, which as you know, is a is a function of financial aid. So they're using their, their very important jobs on campus to help pay for their tuition. And, and that has been historically something that's been powerful and useful in our universities. The system also has a policy that requires background checks for all employees. State law requires background checks for just employees who have contact with minors. The system's policy says all employees will have background checks, carte blanche. So over the years, we've learned that that inclusion, including all of those student workers in that uh, sort of catchment has created challenges. Here's the example. You might have a student who is working for one semester, stocking books at the book bookstore or working in the dining hall uh, or helping, you know, file with, with files in, a, in an office somewhere. And if their background check takes two, three months to, to, to be finished, they could very well miss a half semester of work study, a half semester of financial aid, potentially derailing them from progress. So after much review by our, our HR office and our legal team and input from the universities, uh, we're asking that we maintain our policy, our very robust policy around background checks, but simply carve out the one caveat for student employees who do not have contact with minors. And so uh, those student employees would be exempt from a background check. All other employees, faculty, staff, all official volunteers, and all student employees who might have contact with minors as part of their job 
would still be required to have a background check. Uh, so Mr. Chair, that is the crux of the change. We also cleaned up some, some confusing language that has just been dogging us for a while, but the substance of stuff is what I spoke about. Thank you, Randy. Um, may I have a motion that the board approves the changes to policy 2009-01 as shown in the board materials? I think it's actually on page 25. Or, no, that's wrong. It's in our packet. Yep. <laughs> may I have a motion? <laughs> so moved. Thank you, Mr. Mazur. Second? Second. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions or concerns relative to this policy change? Hearing none. Uh, members of the committee, please say aye if you're in favor. Aye. Aye. Any, any opposed? Hearing none, the motion is adopted. It will go to the full board in a few minutes. And I think that concludes our business. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Appreciate it. Uh, all right. Uh, I'm going to move us now back to the full board for the purpose of considering uh, these committee motions for approval. Um, and we're going to do it uh, in one motion, unless there's objection. So again, these actions include the capital spending plan and the capital budget authorization request, the Menango and Phillipsburg property dispositions, the student trustee appointment, and updates to policy 2009-01. Does any board member wish to divide the motion? No hands in Zoom. OK. Uh, hearing none, therefore, is there a motion to approve today's committee action? So moved. Second? Second. Second. Any discussion? And board members can raise hand in Zoom if you have any comments. Seeing none, Madam Chair. OK. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. The motion carries. Um, I think, uh, Randy, we want to take, or should we? Yeah, let's take a 10-minute break. We do. Yeah. OK. All right. Strict 10 minutes, though. and. Randy's timing it. You know Randy, have See you at, I think it would be a quarter after. I'm going to look at it. 714. 1014.
Right. <laughs> Representative Roy. <laughs> Everyone can take their seats. We'll go ahead and get started. Riggs, Mr. Mr. Gindelsberger, we're going to reconvene. Okay, welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a meaningful break. I know I did. Uh, let us move now to the next item on our agenda, which is ratification of the SCUPA contract. Uh, first, let me say again on behalf of the board uh, how much we appreciate uh, our our SCUPA uh, staff um, and uh, so proud of the work that you do to support our students' success. Uh, and we are so very pleased to have reached this agreement. Thank you so much, Dr. Spalding. I wanted to be sure that you knew uh, how much the board appreciates this. Um, so with that, I move that the board ratifies the collective bargaining agreement with SCUPA and authorizes the chancellor and the chair to execute the appropriate documents. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Okay. okay, hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Thank you very much, the motion carries. Uh, now, I am very pleased to move to the next item on our agenda because we are going to be able to hear from Dr. Shelley Shearer, who is the president and CEO of our Pashi Foundation. Um, I'm so glad to welcome you. Hi, Good morning. great to see you. Uh, so le le let me just uh, introduce uh, Shelly a little bit. Just prior to joining us in uh, 2023, so fairly recently, Shelly helped lead the Pittsburgh Promise Program, uh, something that I know very, very well, having, uh, having been on the board, and actually my husband was one of the founders, uh, one of the corporations that, that helped found it and was on the founding board in Pennsylvania. Um, it's a remarkable organization and it's had some incredible impacts on students in Western Pennsylvania. Um, and of course, the work is very important and could not have happened without the fundraising, which is why we love Shelly so much, uh, because she brings with her a wealth of experience and expertise uh, as she heads up our, our Pashi Foundation. And I, I will say that Shelly, since arriving here, you and your team have really hit the ground running um, to ensure the Pashi Foundation's efforts are in total alignment with our system's top priorities. And we really look forward to hearing your update now. Thank you. Thank you for your time and thank you for that lovely introduction. I have been a part of Team Pashing now for eight months. And, you know, I'm just so grateful for the warm welcome I received from the foundation staff and board, as well as the colleagues I get to work with in the Office of Chancellor and at our university. So thank you for making uh, my entrance uh, fun and uh, just a warm welcome. And it is a privilege to be in this role. I am nothing if I'm not passionate about making college accessible and affordable for our students. That's the work I did at the Pittsburgh Promise. That's why I went to graduate school. And that's why I really love uh, the work that we're about here and, uh, and look forward to sharing a little bit um, about what we're doing. From what I understand, some of you may know a little bit about the foundation. So I'll do a quick hit on our mission and role. Uh, who we are today, I'll throw in a little bit of history. Um, I'll talk about briefly our priorities and goals and end with an invitation. I know most of you have this slide deck in your um, materials. If there's more details you want, I have an annual report that I'm welcome to share with you that has our financials and just more information about the direct scholarship impacts that we have on our students today. So you can go to the next slide. Thanks, Randy. So our mission is really pretty simple. We raise money and we build partnerships in service of our students and our universities. We do this through three streams of engagement. One is that we serve as the advancement support for Office of Chancellor initiatives. So these are system level initiatives ranging from event sponsorships of our DEI summit or our student business startup, employer partnerships, and project funding. And those projects range in focus and in scope from the recent grant that Dan alluded to from the Strata Foundation 
to support a new work-based learning initiatives, I call it internships on steroids, um, to enhance, to another uh, project enhancing the state system's longitudinal data set through multi-state collaboratives and other ways to really leverage the insights of the incredible data resources that we have. We are also providing direct support to multi-university fundraising initiatives, and this is outside of the scope of Office of Chancellor. We are very much focused on growing the pie by leveraging the systemness and the scale that we have as a network of very strong universities. Just to give you a couple examples of what that might look like, uh, we have a grant under consideration now with the Department of Labor and Industry to scale a career development initiative that was started at Shippensburg, but because of the demand that they have received from employers, they're looking to scale it by collaborating with Commonwealth, IUP, and Cutstown universities to serve more students and more employers. And that's the kind of energy and collaboration that is exciting to see. We are also facilitating consortia applications for federal funding. We have just started this work as of January 1st. We have a contract with a firm that is helping support this. We engaged our first conversation with grant officers from all 10 universities participated in the conversation. And this first collaborative grant application will seek to strengthen the research enterprise to increase faculty preparation in sponsored research. So nine of our 10 universities will participate in that consortia grant with the 10th still considering it if it fits in their, um, their scope. So finally, we also actively fundraise to support our own scholarship portfolio. So the Pashi Foundation has um, our own website, our own portfolio of scholarships that are open to any student at any of our universities. And uh, we certainly are excited about the support that we're able to provide through those scholarships. In addition to scholarships, we also fundraise and administer a financial crisis grant called KEEP for West Penn University in Cheney. So before I go to my next slide, uh, I do want to say that uh, from talking to University Foundation and advancement leaders, I have also found it's important to stress what we do not do. So I'm going to pause and just highlight what we do not do. We do not compete with individual universities. We are on the federal level going for consortia grants that can only be pursued by more than one university teaming up. So we will never directly compete with one of our universities. We also do not solicit alumni from universities. That is the um, passion and territory of those individual universities. It is not my intent that we compete uh, where we have shared employer relationships or funder relationships. And so just keeping the lines of communication open has worked us uh, worked well so far. And I continue to have that expectation. So yeah, we can go to the next slide just in terms of who we are today. I'm not gonna read this. You can read it yourself. Um, by way of background, some of you may know that it was Chancellor Emeritus McCormick who founded the foundation by a slightly different name back in 1985. And at that point, um, its mission was to support the educational mission and activities of the state system by generating private sector support and engaging in other activities to advance the system. This was changed a little bit in 2004 to start to pivot to community development and workforce development, but it wasn't really until 2020 that that pivot came into full force through the joint effort of the foundation and the state system to launch a prepared for PA campaign to invest in campus based innovation to equip adult learners with the industry recognized credentials that they need to secure jobs in high demand industries. With the COVID pandemic, it was at that time we launched the emergency grant program I referenced earlier, and it is specifically designed to retain students who would otherwise have to drop out due to a relatively small financial crisis that falls outside the scope of traditional financial aid. So today from these collaborations and these conversations, you know, we are very excited about the conversations that are happening um, with the governor's budget proposal. And we look forward to continuing to um, be part of that work with our partners in the employer sector, as well as our partners at the universities. So next slide. So another way to look at the work we do is through the lens of the values that are driving our priorities. So 
you know, here again, you know, we are very uh, committed to being aligned with the state systems goal. With respect to economic prosperity, we are doing a work to support that by securing funds and partnerships to enhance connections between students and Pennsylvania's employers, AKA the Work-Based Learning Project. Um, we also fund new workforce development pilot programs and scholarships aimed at adult learners so they can access the skills that they need to up their game um, and to be prepared to fill in for those high demand jobs. We have um, most of our scholarships are funded by corporations who want to gain early access to our uh, students by those relationships and connections, and we continue to offer those opportunities. Social mobility also addressed through scholarships and emergency aid. And finally, we support those multi-university initiatives I mentioned earlier. And again, the point there is that we are seeking to leverage the assets of the state system and strengthen the infrastructure that we all need to make sure the whole of the system remains greater than the sum of its parts. Next slide. So again, you'll see a familiar three-pronged strategy. <laughs> if, uh, if you haven't picked up on that, that's how I think. Uh, so here's our goals for this year. Um, I'm new to this role, and so the way that I approach the year is uh, also through these lenses. You know, one, one of it is building the brand to make sure that folks know about the Pesci Foundation, the work we do to support the state system. Uh, we're laser focused on bringing dollars in the door, so that has been a top priority, and it's been exciting to see the support for those uh, proposals come through. And finally, we're doing a lot of listening. So we're doing that by talking to our students, by talking to our colleagues on the university campuses and listening to opportunities to support the Office of Chancellor. And, you know, on the this last point, you know, it was my observation coming into this role that Pashi had spent the first five years really uh, focused internally on financial stabilization. And that has gone well enough that I'm entering at a time where there's a turn um, to look externally, uh, to look at ways that we can build and, uh, you know, feels to me like an important inflection point. So it's an exciting time to be part of the conversation. So next slide. So in closing, I would not be doing my job if I did not extend an invitation to you. So I welcome the opportunity to have conversations with you and ask that you would join us in advancing the state system mission. And you can do that through a variety of ways. Many of you have the personal capacity to make contributions. That can be to an innovation fund to support the work that Dan is driving at the system office level. Uh, we certainly have scholarships to support students through a variety of um, mechanisms, whether that's their field of study, their financial situation, or the university um, geography that they're uh, in right now. We're also looking for uh, specific um, project support to provide matches to unleash government funds. So many of you may know that government agencies have a lot of dollars available, but a signal to them that it's really something that the public needs is when a private individual or company comes up to match it. So we do have some opportunities there, especially on the data side where we can get government support, but we need to have a private match to make that happen. You can also introduce us to folks. There are a lot of people very well connected and very well positioned in this room. And to the extent that you're able to just make an introduction, the ask is very simple, 30 minutes of their time to explore how their values and our work come together. And those conversations are fun. Um, and I look forward to having them with, with your colleagues. And I just want to close by saying thank you for your service. I know that this is a job on top of a job for many of you. And uh, it's, it's fun and it's important. So thank you. Wait. Hold on one second, Shelly. Are there any any questions or any comments uh, for Shelly? Well, we thank you very much for the presentation. And of course, as the board know, knows, I generally do an annual solicitation letter too. So con consider that uh, and mine together. Uh, and, and we appreciate it. And of course, appreciate uh, the board's ongoing support 
um, for PASHI and for our individual institutions as well. Uh, all right, terrific. Um, we are now moving to, um, I, I think, the closing piece of business, but a very, very special piece of business. Um, it's a special recognition. And, uh, you know, those of us who uh, have been on the board um, for, you know, more than for more than a few years, I know that this will really resonate with you. Um, many of us had the honor of serving on this board or in other organizations uh, with Bishop Audrey Bronson of blessed memory. We were so saddened to learn uh, that she passed away last month at the wonderful age of 94. Um, hers was truly a life well lived. Um, she, of course, a, a completely remarkable woman. She was a spiritual leader, an educator, and a mentor uh, to so many. Um, we want to honor her life and her memory with a resolution. And before I read it, I would just add personally uh, that actually she and I were appointed to the board at the same time. We came on together um, in 2016. And uh, she was, I mean, what can I say? She was so smart and so wise um, and frequently had a pithy comment to make. Um, and uh, she she loved students. She loved people. Um, she loved what she did. She loved education uh, and believed in our mission uh, and, of course, Cheney's mission, uh, where she served so 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 well with all of her heart. So let me read this resolution uh, for Dr. Bronson. Whereas Dr. Audrey Bronson led a life of service to others beginning at the age of 14 when she began preaching and continuing into adulthood when she founded the Sanctuary of the Open Door Church in West Philadelphia almost 50 years ago, and whereas she served our students as a professor of psychology at Cheney University and later as a trustee of Cheney University, and whereas she served the entire state system and the people of the Commonwealth as a member of this Board of Governors, therefore be it resolved that the Board of Governors and the students, faculty, and staff of the state system of higher education honor the life and memory of Bishop Audrey Bronson and recognize her lifelong commitment of service to the people of the Commonwealth. And by voice acclamation, I move approval of this resolution. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, and President Walton, may I call on you to say a few words? You most certainly, most certainly can. Thank you. Um, I was honored to actually attend the homegoing service of Bishop Bronson and the state system was on the program. So mm -hmm. leaning back on my old role as Board of Governors member, I represented the state system as well as Cheney at her funeral. And uh, it was a sight to behold. Uh, her life of service, you know, the one word I can use for her was impact. Uh, she had impact on a lot of individuals, both in the religious community and in her community, thousands who she touched uh, as a professor at Cheney, and then as a bishop, and then as a board member here at the uh, at the state system, um, her legacy will live on. And that's probably the best compliment you have is whenever you die, folks remember that you lived. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Oh, terrific. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, and may I call on uh, Vice Chair Dave Mazur to say a few words. And I, I just want to note, I think, uh, Aaron, you were vice chair at, at the at yeah, the so, time. So both of us were two, two vice chairs, uh, both of whom knew her very well. Mr. Mazur. Um, Bishop Bronson was a special woman. Um, people throw around the words um, lived experience a lot today um, in a way that I think kind of rings somewhat shallow. She is a woman who truly had a lived experience. Uh, the things she saw, the things she did, the people she touched. Um, she was well into her 80s when she joined us on this board, and she was um, such a wonderful voice of uh, history, reason, perspective, and and caring. Um, you know, she, she would take the train here um, 
you know, she 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 grew up at a time before cars. She lived through all of the racial issues in this country. Um, she, you know, we would use computers, something that, you know, can you imagine what it was like when she was born? Um, she was a truly remarkable person and, and, a, and a friend and um, they don't make her like her a lot. So I just wanted to thank her. Or may her memory be a blessing. Thank you. Thank you. Any anyone else want to? Yeah. Jan, sure. Yeah, just add a small human touch. So when I started coming to these meetings, um, I'm perpetually cold, and Audrey was so 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 sympathetic. It got so she would come to these meetings bringing an extra blanket, a literally <laughs> a blanket, in case I got cold, so that she could wrap me up. And that's how caring she was. You know what? I just want to add to that because you just made me remember the same thing because I, too, am perpetually cold. And it, it was a, a, a retreat in Hershey, a board retreat in Hershey. I remember this well. And she brought a shawl and offered me a shawl also, which yeah. may or may not have been. I'm not sure if you were on the board at that time, but I have that distinct memory yeah, also. I never made it to Hershey, but. Uh, yeah, that, that was, was OK. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does anybody else uh, on the board or, or, or any of the presidents yeah, who knew her or yeah, anybody I'm else want to say something? Larry, please, of course, Larry. Yes, I was very fortunate to actually be attending Cheney while, while Audrey Bronson was a professor there. And she was so good at what she did. She was one of those uh, instructors that I made sure I avoided because that's how tough she was <laughs> on you when you went to her class. <laughs> But I have to tell you the impact that she had in terms of how she treated people, how she taught. And she was one of the most classy ladies in terms of how she dressed um, and was making sure that as students, when we left there, we knew the importance of how we presented ourselves to the rest of the world. And as a member of Cheney's Council of Tr Trustees, always articulate, always caring, and always thinking about students first. So she will be missed not only by us, but you know, a ton of folks that were Black to have gone through her while they were students at Cheney University. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, an elegant woman on top of everything else. You're right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, just to close us out for the record, I want to report that the board met in executive session on January 10th and on January 24th from 8.30 a.m. until 9.30 a.m. and again yesterday from 1.30 p.m. until 2.15 to discuss contractual and legal matters. Before we adjourn, is there any other business to come before the board? Yes, please, Tina. Thank you. Um, just want to reflect on some of the themes we've heard here over the past uh, two days, but really over the past four or five years. We've been through a lot of change and the governor is presenting more change. And I think that there is something that Pashi and the Board of Governors could convey to the faculty and the staff across the system is that appreciation for the change that has occurred over the past four years. This is in addition to us all living through our first pandemic, hopefully our only pandemic, but our first pandemic. So if I could just make a suggestion as somebody who researches and tries to make suggestions on ways in which to prevent burnout among workers is let's figure out how to make sure everybody knows that they are really appreciated. And to just reflect, especially on what uh, Dr. Mash mentioned earlier about the coaches in my role as a full-time academic advisor faculty member, I realize the importance of the coaches in helping to promote our student athletes' mental health, to promote their positive outcomes at their universities. We know that student athletes have positive outcomes when they have a relationship with their coach. And in my role as an academic advisor, I lean on the coaches to help me get the students in my office so that we can plan their next semester and student athlete schedules are very complicated because we have to work around their practice schedules as well as their travel schedules for games. And that is a huge puzzle. And it's that relationship with the coach that I can call and say, 
I still haven't met with these five athletes. Next time they're at practice, make sure you remind them to get to me in my office. Um, so they play a vital role. And when there's turnover among anyone at our institutions, we lose that institutional knowledge and we lose relationships. And really, if we're going to succeed as a system, it's the importance of those relationships that are going to get us through these next challenging years because another huge transformation is not going to be an easy lift. So thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your remarks. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, our meeting is adjourned.